Well, good morning to everyone. If you would rise to your feet, we can read God's word. We rise to our feet. We're just going to lift up one short verse. One short verse. We're coming from the book of Luke. That's the doctor, the physician. He traveled everywhere with a gentleman by the name of Paul. But he wrote one post. The book of Luke. We're coming from the seventh chapter. We're going to lift up the 22nd verse. If you have to say amen. If you need more time, just say, hold on, Pastor. All right. Luke is one of the people, people a lot of women like Luke because Luke was speaking when he wrote, he was speaking to the Greek and Roman community. Each of the Gospels was speaking to specific communities. And Luke spoke to the Roman Gentiles and to the Greek Gentiles and to the Gentiles of the Mediterranean Roman world. And he reached out to them, preaching the gospel through the message of the gospel through the book of Luke. If everyone has to say amen. And it reads as follows, verse 22. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached. Please be seated. Pray with me now. Father God, let us be about the business today of preaching your word, Lord. Let us be about the business of receiving your word. But Lord, most of all, let us be about the business of sharing your word. Once we are done today, as we walk out the four walls of the sanctuary, as we go forth into this world, let us be about preaching the gospel the best way we know how, with our lifestyle. Let our lives and our lip line up with your word, Lord. Let people look to us as the lights that will shine forth, giving you glory, Lord. Let our lives be a reflection of you, that the world who is dying and in need of you see Jesus in us. Lord, my prayer today is that as we leave the sanctuary, as we bump into the people, as we interact with our community, with our friends, with our neighbors, and with people we don't know in Walmart, in Win dixie in Publix, wherever we may go, Lord, that as we are on our jobs, people see you in us. And they want to know that hope of glory that is in us, that they want to hear that message of the gospel that came from you, Lord. Lord, let us be that light that shines forth in this world. Right now, Lord, let my congregation see you and not me. But make me small, but you rise up in me. Let them hear your word and be about the business of giving and spreading your word. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to leave that verse up there one more time. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. Go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard. How the blind see, the lame walk, lepers cleansed, deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached. Go and tell what you've seen and heard. i like to speak from the thought this morning. Show and tell. Show and tell. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, show me and then tell me. Y'all remember when you were little kids, this is one of my favorite times as a little kid. I'm hoping they still do this, that was one of my favorite times was that when you get up there and you bring in an item that was important to you and you would show it and tell it and, and then you tell somebody, this is this thing I got from wherever and this is my special thing and then you tell about it, you show it, then you tell it. And that's real simple. but. The thing about it was exciting was you got to see different things from different kids and everybody got to tell their story about it. And I, I like that. I, I personally, I like that. But I think we've gone away from that because we're so focused on curriculum and, and making sure the kids have everything they need. But there's got to be some time for some imagination, just a little bit of time. But there are times as a Christian in their life that circumstances and events cause you to waver in your faith. And that's when you need to show and tell. Abraham was shaky about his faith, but he walked out of the city of Ur on his faith, taking 25 years for him to truly trust God for Isaac. Jacob, his grandson, waffled back and forth on his faith, even after God renamed him Israel and blessed him. 
he had to be shown and told. Moses came up with his own purpose and plan to deliver Israel by murdering an Egyptian and then he ran to the desert and waited 40 years on the side of a hill on a mountainside called Sinai for God to call him and follow God's plan and will for his life. Many of us today, brothers and sisters, Sean, many of us today are still wrestling with trying to figure out who to follow. Do I follow Jesus or the prince of this world, the devil? Do I do what I think is right in my own eyes or do I follow Jesus? Do I lean and trust on my own understanding of wisdom or trust in the Lord? Hey, brothers and sisters, it's your thing. You do what you want to do. But brother Paul, don't blame nobody. Sister Sue, don't blame nobody when your life is a train wreck because you lean and depend on your own understanding and did depend on God. Let me be clear about it. People across the land, when they're leaning on, depending on Brother Dale, they cry out to God, praying that he'll deliver you, try to save you. But here's the important thing to understand. You didn't ask him to help you when in the beginning. What obligation does he have to help you when you try to make it on your own? But you see, God is merciful. We serve a loving God who will reach down and grab a hold of you and save you. He will not. He will allow you to wallow in your own troubles only until you acknowledge him, know him, follow him, reverence him, and worship him. But until then, God's going to say, buddy, you're on your own. Let's be clear about this, Miss Beverly. I said it all to say all that. What if you're a loyal, faithful follower, a true believer, someone who's confessing and professing, repenting daily, and my life is still a mess? What now, Pastor Stewart? What now? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, trials come to test you. Trials come to strengthen you. Trials come to increase you and perfect your faith. You see, the things that come your way were designed, created, Mary, made just for you. My tests, your tests, our tests were created by God. Tailor made just like a suit in order to fit you, to fit me. Now, it's there to teach you how to lean on and depend on. Say the sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. So what we do when we do it, it seems like sometimes we're all confused. But let me be clear about it. Believe on him. And it seems like sometimes things ain't working out for us anymore. I've heard some people say lately. It seems like God is so far away from me, Miss Yvonne, that I don't know where he is. Miss Lorraine, I can't take it anymore. No way, no how. If I suffer one more setback, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Tears may be flowing down your face. You feel broken inside. You feel rejected and even maybe neglected, Erica, but maybe even feeling alone and unloved. And that's just how the devil wants you to feel. He wants you to feel that God has forsaken you, Miss Teresa, that God has forgotten you, Teresa. But let me be clear about this. In these times, Miss Trisha, in these times, you must put a praise on your lips, a wave in your hands, a stomp in your feet, and a clap in your hands and a praise to the Lord. You've got to remember if God did it before, he can and he will do it again. The psalm writer says, truly God is good to Israel, to such are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet and my hands, I almost stumbled and I almost slipped. But then I remember who my hope is. My hope is in the Lord. I read in Lamentations one, once. That through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness to us, Miss Rachel, that to us we should never doubt. I'm going to ask these questions this morning. Somebody just say Jesus afterwards. Who woke you up this morning? Somebody say Jesus. Who keeping that roof over your head? Jesus. Who gave you the clothes on your back, the food to eat, and that bed to sleep in? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Great is his faithfulness in the midst of our trials, the bad times, the good times. In everything we should give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us.
You see, we're going to see this morning a true believer tested by his circumstances, tried by his situation. He is going to begin to worry. And then he's going to ask the question, was it worth all this trouble to go through, all this hardship, all this pain and suffering? Should I give up my faith or give up and look for someone else or for something else? Should I continue to believe in you, Jesus? Should I just forget about you and look forward to something different? So come closer with me now in the text and look at verse 19. And John, calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look for we for another? This is why I'd like to give you three for the Trinity to the glory of God. My first point. There will be some circumstances in your life that may cause you to doubt your purpose, creating fear, and causing a failure of faith. Ms. Carol, there will be some circumstances in your life that may cause you to doubt your purpose, creating fear, and causing a failure of faith. Let's dissect this text this morning carefully, shall we? John the Baptist is in a precarious situation, Ms. Sue. He's locked up in prison and beginning to doubt his purpose. He's questioning his calling. Look at the text, verse 19. John called unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? He's doubting his purpose, his calling. But we're talking about John, the miracle baby of Elizabeth and Zacchaeus. John, who was filled with the Holy Spirit before his birth. John, that was set, afi set to aside and sanctified. John, who was a walking fashion statement. He didn't wear Gucci or Chanel, but wore a camel skin soup. He was the original creator of the paleo diet. He ate honey and locusts. He was a preacher of repentance from sin and a baptizer. John, whose mission and purpose was to prepare the way for the Lord, to let them know the world that the Messiah, the Son of God, is coming. Who, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That same John now was doubting because he found himself in prison because he spoke truth to power. You see, there was a king called Herod the Tetrarch. He was sleeping with his brother's wife. You don't need soap operas to go watch things like this. You just go to the Bible and you see some stuff that's dirty and crazy, but it's real life. You see, Herodias was his brother's Philip's wife, and they were committing adultery. So John convicted him of his sin and broadcast to the whole world it is not lawful for you to sleep with your brother's wife you cannot have her this is wrong Herod got mad and locked him up in prison no one especially those in power want to hear that they're committing a sin they want to hear that they're wrong because sometimes they feel that they are above the law no matter how wrong they are but John spoke truth, and the truth got him locked up, and then later on, got his head chopped off. You see, he's here now sitting in prison with doubt in his heart, with fear creeping in on him. The devil is whispering in his ear and in his mind, causing him to think that everything he's been doing for the Lord was wrong. That this Jesus isn't the Messiah. Should I be looking for someone else? Have I been wasting my time? The seeds of doubt and fear were causing a failure of faith. See, John knew Jesus was his cousin. He knew Jesus was his family and began to doubt him as his savior. Because of his situation, his comfort zone was crushed. His deluxe accommodations, his fine clothes, his good living, his conditions, the restrictions of his freedom made his faith waver and possibly change. Let's be clear about one thing. He knew that Herod was an ungodly man, capable of murder and mayhem, and that he might not last in prison long. Fear became his new friend, causing him to lose faith. But let me be clear about this, Miss Caroline. The question I have for everyone this morning is this, brothers and sisters. What things are happening in your life causing you to doubt your purpose, casting and causing you to have a failure of faith? 
Didn't Jesus tell us that he overcame the world? Didn't Jesus tell us that he will give us peace? Didn't Jesus tell us he will give us life more abundantly? Didn't Jesus tell us, let not your heart be troubled? If you believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. Now, I know somebody's thinking right now, yes, he said all that. But you don't know what I'm going through, Pastor Stewart. Jesus don't know what I'm going through. Yes, he does. Lord, help my unbelief. Right now, whatever trouble you're going through, Jesus knows. Take comfort in that. He knows. He knows. And he's the only one able to make a way out of no way. Do you need proof of that for somebody here? Let me give you some proof. The Bible is filled with evidence from Genesis to Revelation. You remember that young lady, Ruth, her mother and her, Naomi, they are in need of food, and God sent a kindred redeemer to help them? Remember that guy, Noah? He needed salvation, and God had him build an ark, and he just floated on his troubles? Remember this guy named David? He went up against a giant bigger than him, stronger than him, but he picked up a rock and busted him in the snot box? When we were dying in the trespasses of our sins. God sent his son Jesus to put him on the cross to save him from death, hell, and the grave. If God made a way to pay that mortgage, if God made a way to pay that overdue light bill, if God paid a way to pay that water bill, pay that rent, paid every bill, and kept you and woke you up, God will make a way for you to go on to the next day. Then the God I serve the God we serve, the God we love will make a way out of no way every time. Why, Nancy? Because we are the child of the one true king. God is not a man that he should lie. His character, his very nature, he is holy. He has to keep his word. And he said he would provide for us. We his children. Let me be clear. If you need more proof than that, well then just look at the cross behind me. That's all the proof you need. John told his disciples, go the same disciples asked Jesus the question that I've been asking myself, that I've been doubting. I'm scared. I'm in this prison cell. Help my unbelief. Look at the text, verse 20. When the men had come unto him, the him there is Jesus, and said, John the Baptist has sent us unto him, saying, Are thou he that should come, or look we for another? Fathers, Husbands, wives, mothers, everyone here in the leadership position. It is up to you to show confidence. Display the, and set the example of hope for your family and the people under your authority. When situations look hopeless, your hope is in Jesus and nothing else. He'll never fail you. When your faith fails, lean on and depend on Jesus. Let me be clear about it. We're going to have some scary situations. You're going to get that phone call from the doctor. You're going to get that phone phone call from wherever and it's going to make your heart stop and pause for a minute it's going to make you tremble but you got to know where your help comes from my help your help our help comes from the lord start reading god's word look to your true help when your problems seem bigger than your god watch this that's the devil telling you a lie your God, my God, our God is greater, our God is better, our God is larger than any problem you got. Time and time again, when trouble comes our way, we rather complain than praise. We rather whine than praise. We rather cry about how bad things are than give thanks for what we have. Remember the word of God says, give thanks in all circumstances. Not complain. It doesn't say complain. It says give thanks in all circumstances. That word in tells you that you're in something. You're in the doo-doo section. You're in the mess up section. You're in, the, you're in the deep end of the pool where you're drowning. You're stepped all up in it and you can't get out of it. The only way you're going to get out is through Jesus. Try this the next time something bad comes your way. Try this the next time something wicked comes your way. Focusing on God and not your problems. And then watch your God who's already big get bigger than your problem. Watch your God as you start worshiping instead of worrying. Watch how small your problems get and become because why? You're looking up instead of looking down. You're looking wide and broad instead of looking down. You're looking at the great I am. We need to stop and remember who God is. If God did it before, he can and will do it again. Somebody say amen if you believe that. 
Sometimes the proof or the evidence can be found in the details. Look at the text, verses 21 and 22. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of the evil spirits. And to many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering and said unto them, Go your way and tell God, John what things ye have seen and heard, and how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are rise, raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. We see my second point. You have to go tell what you've seen in great detail of both the visual results with a verbal report. You have to go and give in great detail. Go tell what you've seen in great detail, both the visual results with a verbal report. Look at verse 21 again. That very moment John's disciples arrived. At the same hour, it says, they see Jesus in the act of healing and casting out demons. There's a complete listing of the details of what was Jesus was doing. Jesus was hard at work doing his job as the Savior of the world, the shepherd of the lost, and the bishop of our souls. John's boys, his friends, his homies, had a front row seat to what Jesus was doing, and they were seeing it for themselves, the Messiah of the world, hard at work. They saw the visual results. Jesus cured many of their infirmities, their plagues. He cast out evil spirits and gave sight to the blind. And now Jesus responds to the question, Art thou he that should come, or we look for another? Jesus wasn't being sarcastic when he answered them, but he answered them the only way he knew how, by saying, You just saw and heard what I did. Jesus went even further in verse 21. and says, He cured many infirmities many plagues, cast out many evil spirits, and gave sight to the blind. But what it doesn't say is that Jesus added on what he had been doing all along, for a long time already. He was giving life. Look at verse 22. It tells it all. Basically, he was saying, if you're going to give the report, if you're going to tell John everything, don't leave nothing out. Look at the text. John, I want you to know these things I've been doing. How I made the blind to see. How I made the lame to walk. Lepers are cleansed. Deaf to hear. Dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel of the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. In other words, I'm the one you've been looking for. You don't have to look any further. Let me be clear about it. I'm doing my job right here. I'm loving the unlovable. I'm touching the untouchable. I'm giving hope to the hopeless. I am Jesus, the living son of God. So John, if you don't mind, I've got to get back to work saving the whole world. Jesus gave John's disciples full details of what was going on so that the results of their final report reflected the truth. Now, let's be clear about one thing that Jesus was doing. He was fulfilling the prophecy that was given by Isaiah in the book of Isaiah in chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. Anybody here want to hear the good news of the Lord? Say amen. amen. Are you ready to hear how God loves you say amen. Let me tell you, God gave his only begotten son to die on that cross for that you and me can have eternal life. You gotta be, you must be born again. That's the preaching of the good news. I want everyone to know that for themselves, in their heart. So come on, let's give God some glory right now as we get ready to review. Come on, give God some glory. 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 But let's review our first point. Point number one, there will be some circumstances in life that may cause you to doubt. Your purpose creating fear and causing a failure of faith. Don't give up hope, y'all. My second point, you have to go tell what you've seen in great detail. Don't be leaving anything out, but tell in great detail both the visual results with the verbal report. But lastly, my third and final point, because you show and tell the gospel, Jesus will provide you with a righteous defense because he knows that you will always be persecuted, but you'll never be ashamed. You will always be persecuted. People are going to hate on you because you believe in Jesus, but you'll never be ashamed. That's what I love about my God. He's our great defender. Look at verse 23. 
And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed is he, blessed is she, blessed is whosoever shall not be offended in me. Let me translate that into modern day English. Blessed is the man or woman that is not ashamed of me when they are persecuted because they believe in me. The Bible tells of a time when people are just going to give up their faith. They're going to literally run from believing because of persecution. They're going to drop Jesus and say, hey, I love the world more than I love the Lord. Into those hands, they're going to be in for judgment. Jesus is well aware that, jail, that John is in jail. He knew everything that John was going through because he created John. He knows because he's omniscient. He knows that John is afraid. That's why later on in verse 28 of the same chapter, Jesus gives John this compliment saying, No greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What Jesus wanted John to know, and you and I to know, is this. He is our defense. Matthew 10 says, Fear not them that can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. You see, people, mankind, can hurt your body. They can physically kill you, but they cannot take your soul. In other words, Jesus is with us in those dangerous life and death trials and circumstances. You see, think about those missionaries that go overseas. Think about those missionaries in other countries. They go forward knowing that their life may be in jeopardy. But they go forward knowing that greater is he who is in me than in this world. So they know that when they go out to these foreign places where people can hurt them and people can harm them, they know they can only hurt my body, but they cannot take my soul. Jesus went on further to say, but rather fear God who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Hello, somebody. We should fear God, believe on his son Jesus for eternal life, worship and praise him. But here's where we fall short of the glory of God. Because we're still in the flesh, sometimes we get shaky. Sometimes this world gets all crazy and persecution and hardship does come our way. Then we get easily rattled when things look scary. You see, Moses took too long to come off the mountainside and the Israelites started building idols. Jezebel said boo to Elijah and he ran 200 miles away from his ministry. Goliath shouted insults all day long and the Israelite army wet their pants in fear. John got locked up for preaching truth to power and got scared. What has you afraid this morning that you can't trust in Jesus? What has you afraid this morning that you are afraid to move forward in faith? Is it persecution? Is it your bills? Is it the doctor's report? Whatever it is, take it to the Lord in prayer. Is it is persecution now? If it's persecution, Jesus said, tell us, told us in the Gospel of John that we will suffer persecution in his sake. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But if you keep my word, I will protect you. If the world hated you, know that it hated me before it hated you first. No pressure. No pressure. Just know that Jesus has your back. He is a strong defense and reward. Remember Stephen when he got stoned? But Jesus stood up, the scripture says. Jesus endured the shame of the cross so that you and I can never be ashamed. Look at the text again. Again, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Jesus said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who went before you. So rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you partake in the sufferings of Christ. When his glory is revealed, you will be glad. Now, the scripture also tells you with Peter that if anyone suffers as a Christian, let them not be ashamed, but let them glorify God in this matter. So I just want to bring it back again. I threw it out there earlier. The life application is this. Give thanks in all circumstances. Bad, good, otherwise. For this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. There are some bad times. We lose loved ones. We lose jobs. We lose our health. We lose. But with Christ, we are always winners. It says we are victors. We have victory in Jesus. We sing that song. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. We sing that song with the hope and knowledge that Jesus is our Lord and our winner. He's our great defender. 
So Randy, when I was a kid, we used to do that thing called show and tell. I told you about that. But you would show it off to your class what was special and important to you. But dad, God does the same thing for us. He shows everyone in the world that we are important to him. So Margie, let me show and tell you in God's word how important we are. Remember Job and God told the devil he could hurt him and do what he wants to him and take his wealth. And he still remained faithful to God. The devil hurt Job, but Job never said a mumbling word against God. The Lord gave and the Lord has blessed and taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what Job did. All throughout the whole time through his suffering, he never charged God with wrong, but one thing, he was never charged with wrong or sin. But God allowed everything to go wrong in his life, but he praised God through all the things. I'll say it before and I'll say it again. God has allowed God has allowed whatever to happen to you to happen to you. It's not your fault. Ain't no, ain't nothing that you've done wrong. It's just part of what happens in life. Trials come to make you strong, to increase your faith. James 1, 2, and 4 says, brethren, I'm going to add a little extra to it, sistering, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The word various means different kind of trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience and let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing should I count it all joy when come, what comes my way yes yes you should but I'm gonna read that part again it will have a perfect work perfect work means somebody's gonna see you and hope to be like you because how is it that she or he is having all these things happening how they able to make it. They look at you as the example on your job. The example in your family. As the trials are coming your way, they look to you as that bedrock and foundation in Christ. Once the testing of your faith is over, you have been doing the triumph. Now you are perfected, complete, lacking nothing. Let me show and tell you one more time. God loves you. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And because he loves you, when fear comes away and you have to fail your faith, we must not be given a spirit of fear, but of sound love and power of mind. But it's in the details. For when we are still without strength and do Christ died for the ungodly. It is in the details that God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God is our defense that he's able to save us to the utmost those that will come to him through him. He will always make intercessions for them. If God be for us, who can be against us? I've come to put my trust in God. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is a light in my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is a strength for my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but my Jesus will never forget me and hold me. People have all kinds of things ready to hurt you. But I got good news for somebody. Your God, my God, my Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to say this to you and then we're going to close. Psalms 23, 4 and 5 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But verse 5, I was reading it the other day, and it totally woke me up to a new, and I've, I've read this passage over and over again, and saw it anew the other day. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hold on. God has prepared the table. That means he's putting you there with your enemies. He's spreading out the blanket like a big picnic. Prepare a table. Put you right there with your enemies. But he tells you before you're walking through that valley. Fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As you're sitting with your enemies. Presence of your enemies. And while you're there, look what he does. He anoints your head with oil and he blesses you. It's running over. Oh, my God. Somebody should have shot it right out the back door. And you're going through right there with your enemies and they can't touch you. And God is blessing you right there in front of them. Hello, somebody. I'm going to say this and I'm done. He walks with me. 
and he talks to me and tells me he's my own. And the joy as we tarry there, no other has known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gives to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and tells me he's my own. I'm his own. And there's no other love I have ever known greater than that, than the love of Jesus. To God be the glory.